All right, everyone, thank you for uh, coming to this session. As Jules said, my name is Silvio Fiorito. I'm a resident solutions architect uh, with Databricks. I've been with Databricks uh, almost two years now. Uh, and uh, prior to that, I was uh, working as a Spark developer, independent consultant. And uh, like Jules said, I've been using Spark since pretty early on, the, around 0 0.6 timeframe. And prior to that, I was uh, working a lot around uh, application security, cyber analytics, and forensics, which is actually what led me to start using Spark uh, back in those early days, because I was really looking for something that could perform a lot better, uh, could handle uh, more data, and do a lot of the iterative analysis and ad hoc analysis that uh, I was trying to do at the time. So this talk is uh, called uh, Lessons from the Field. Uh, because I work with a lot of Databricks customers that, uh, you know, are, some are new to Spark, some have been using Spark for a while, and uh, it, I've started to see a lot of uh, trends, uh, some, some issues that people uh, tend to hit when they're, when they're uh, uh, taking their applications to production, and so I just wanted to share some of those lessons with you. So uh, it's kind of broken up in three sections. One is really about uh, file loading and partition discovery, uh, then optimizing file storage and layout, and then identifying bottlenecks in your uh, Spark queries. So one of the first questions I tend to get a lot, especially with people new to Spark, is you know, why is it taking so long to load my data? And I put load in quotes because you know, if you're familiar with Spark, you're not actually loading any data until you actually uh, run an action on, on your, uh, your query, whether it's RDDs or data frames. Um, and in this case, I'm you know, really focusing on data frames. So let's take an example like this. Right? This is a standard you know, data frame uh, a query. I'm loading a data set. In this case, it's a Parquet data set. I'm pointing to uh, a, a file path on S3 and then I'm applying a filter. So first thing is, you know, Spark is lazily, lazily executed, right? That's one of the things that, like, when you're new to Spark, you're always, uh, you know, hearing about, and, and, you know, trainers are always repeating, like, you know, Spark is lazily e executed. You apply transformations to your query, and then finally you take some sort of action, something like a count or a write or a for each, and then actually your, part, your, your query executes and, and things start kicking off. So if that's the case, then why am I seeing uh, two Spark jobs kicking off here, and one of them has 1,823 tasks? So in order to understand why, it, uh, it helps to kind of dive into some of the internals of Spark. So first, when we define a, uh, a spark.read.load, this is the data frame reader API, which then calls the data source API. So the data source API takes all your, your uh, commands that you've defined in your load query and then uh, passes them on to the underlying data source. So by default, it's Parquet, but you know, it can support CSV, ORC, JSON, right? all the built-in uh, data sources, as well as any third party or uh, other uh, data sources from, from the open source community. In this case, I'm going to focus uh, primarily on file sources. So the first thing Spark needs to do is actually understand what files you're asking it to load. It needs to understand uh, you know, how many files there are, what the uh, uh, partitioning layout is, if it has partitions, you know, what folders there are, and so forth. So in order to do that, it actually has to kick off a job. Uh, and I'll go into more detail of, of what exactly is happening behind the scenes. Now, in addition, Spark wants to get some uh, basic statistics for query planning. And at a minimum, uh, it can use uh, file size, right, of, of the partitions that you're, you're loading. So the data source API then uses another internal uh, class called the in-memory file index. So the in-memory file index is responsible for doing the partition discovery. So it, uh, you know, does a file listing on, uh, you know, S3 or HDFS, and from there, it may decide that it needs to actually kick off a Spark job because it needs to parallelize the, the uh, file listings. And there's an internal setting uh, that I've listed here. So the default is 32. So anything over 32 uh, folders uh, 
will essentially kick off a, uh, a job in order to parallelize for best performance. And, and this is especially true if you're using S3 or you know, other cloud storage, because file listings tend to be a little bit slower on, uh, on cloud storage. Now, as it's uh, getting the file listings, it's actually caching that internally in another uh, uh, um, uh, API called the file status cache. So again, because it's, it can be an expensive operation to do these file listings, we want to avoid redoing that again and again. So it actually uh, stores some of this in this file status cache. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that there's a 250 meg default for this cache, and it's shared across the Spark session. So if you're using a notebook environment or you have you know, multiple users sharing a Spark session, you know, multiple concurrent queries, they're all sharing the same cache when they're uh, loading data frames. So then once it gets this file status cache, it also maps hive style partitions to uh, the columns that you would see so you can do partition pruning in your queries. Uh, so the nice thing here is that it's actually treating the, the partition uh, values as uh, standard uh, row um, columns, or columns in the, the row objects. I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, that allows Spark to uh, apply all your complex filtering uh, to these, uh, the, these values. So, you know, one thing I've noticed is that sometimes, you know, people will break up, uh, like, date columns uh, into different fields so that they can do, like, filtering by month or by year. Uh, you actually don't need to do that. You can use a standard date format as your uh, partition value, and then you can apply all the uh, complex, you know, uh, built-in functions or any uh, custom functions, uh, custom UDFs on those partition values. And then finally, when it's time to execute your query, uh, the in-memory file index is actually responsible for doing the partition pr pruning for you. So in the query I listed here earlier, um, it's actually partitioned by the uh, uh, sold date uh, key. And I'm filtering for uh, only four dates, but it's actually still partition, or it's actually still indexing all 1,823 partition paths. So if we look at the query plan, when I actually want to execute it, it's actually only going to go against four of those uh, partitions. So only four uh, paths on S3. So you know, it's, a, it's a lot of wasted time uh, going to index all those other 1,800-something uh, uh, paths, right? So what are some options we have? So one, if you want to stick with uh, using the, the read.load API, you're wanting to stick with files, you can actually uh, force uh, the in-memory file index to only index the, the, the paths that you're interested in. So there's an option called base path that you can specify. Uh, which then you, you specify the base path of uh, where your data set is, and then in your load command, you actually specify the particular uh, partitions that you want to actually read. So it essentially, it's applying a, uh, a, a partition pruning ahead of time. So this is what it looks like, right? So right off the bat, uh, it went from 43 seconds to 2 seconds to, uh, you know, get get this data frame, okay? So you can imagine, you know, when you're dealing with a much larger data set with, uh, you know, you could be having hundreds of thousands of partitions, you know, this is one option that you could apply. But, you know, realistically, this is not very convenient, right? You, you, having to write code like this is, is uh, it, you know, is error prone and, uh, you know, just, it, it's not as convenient as simply uh, specifying your filters within the data frame query. So the second option, would be to use uh, data source tables. And uh, starting with Spark 2.1, starting with uh, Spark 2.1, uh, the partitions are actually managed within the Hive Metastore. And what happens is uh, all the metadata for the partitions is in the Metastore. So it avoids having to index uh, the partitions at, uh, uh, at runtime. And uh, it only does it once. And then at uh, the logical planning stage, Catalyst will actually apply the partition pruning. And we have a really good blog post on the Databricks site that goes into more details of this. But just to 
show what that looks like. So the only difference is we use spark.read.table, and I'll show the syntax for actually defining this table. And then we apply the filter that we did before, and we actually went down from 43 seconds to less than one second. So this is what it would look like. There's two types of data source tables. There's the external or what we call unmanaged tables. And so this is where you would define a, a hive schema over uh, an existing data set. And what you would need to do in that case, since you know, uh, the Metastore knows nothing of this data set, is you would have to do the partition discovery once. And then anytime you want to add additional data to it, you just simply use the save as table or the insert into uh, command. Now, uh, in order to do that partition discovery, you just run this repair table command here at the bottom. And again, you need to do that only once. And it'll run that in-memory file index logic, you know, get all the, the partitions uh, and all the sizes and, uh, and so forth, and then uh, you're done. You don't have to do that again. Now, a managed table is where Spark SQL is managing both the schema, the metadata, and the underlying files. So what this means is if you go and drop a partition or drop this table, it will actually remove the underlying files. So this is the difference between the managed and unmanaged tables. With the unmanaged table, you can drop uh, partitions, drop tables, and it won't actually touch the underlying files. Now in this case, Hive is also keeping track of the schema, which is another uh, good option for optimization, uh, which I'll go into more detail here in a second. So in order to add uh, additional, or I'm sorry, in, in order to use the data frame API instead of the SQL API, this is how you would do it, right? So to create a managed table, you would just say write partition by and then save as table. And for unmanaged table, the only difference is you specify the uh, uh, path option. So just to get an overview, the difference between tables and files. So with tables, you get managed, more scalable partition uh, handling within the, the Metastore. With files, it's going to be running that partition discovery every time you define a data frame. And so again, in, you know, if you're in a notebook environment and uh, you, know, you basically rerun that cell, that notebook cell that defines that data frame, it's actually going to go back and do that indexing all over again. So you know, it's one thing in terms of uh, whether you're doing like automated jobs or you're working in a notebook and you're really concerned about um, uh, you know, uh, uh, query throughput or just response time for the end user, uh, tables are gonna give a better experience. Uh, in tables, again, the schema is stored in the Metastore. With files, it's gotta infer the schema. And in most cases, inferring the schema, even from Parquet files or ORC files, or, you know, any of these self-describing formats, it still has to run a job in order to, to scan all the files to understand the, uh, the schema. So again, with tables uh, versus files, you know, tables, you know, you'll have a faster job, job startup, uh, whether it's an automated job or interactive query. And another thing with tables is you can actually uh, get additional benefits from uh, additional statistics that are available that I'll go into more detail in a second, uh, specifically things like cost-based optimizer uh, that you can't get from uh, using just uh, tables, or I'm, I'm sorry, instead of just using files. With files, you only get file size statistics. So that's useful when you're doing things like you know, broadcast joins, but uh, it won't help beyond that in terms of query planning. And with tables, of course, you can use both the SQL and data frame API, of course. Uh, with files, uh, you can only use the data frame API unless you then define a uh, temp view or a temp table over the, the data frame. So you know, if you have like SQL users or BI use cases, you know, obviously using tables is another a reason to, to go that path. So in terms of uh, you know, inferring schema, so one issue that I see a lot with uh, new users is uh, dealing with CSV and JSON files. You know, so here again, it's gotta infer the schema uh, unless you, you provide it ahead of time. And in order to do that, it's actually going to scan the whole data set. And that's convenient when you're dealing with small data sets, but uh, you know, with realistic you know, multi-gig or you know, terabyte data sets, that's extremely slow. And again, it's another thing that's gonna just uh, give a bad user experience or slow, slow your jobs. 
So it gets really bad when you're dealing with uh, large gzip files, like large text uh, CSV gzip files, or you have a lot of small files, because again, it's running a Spark job to do this indexing, and it's just gonna slow things down even further. So what are some ways that you can avoid uh, you know, inferring the schema? Well, one, again, the, the obvious is just using tables. Uh, but if you can't or don't want to do that, uh, you know, one option is if you have like, consistent data, there's no need to you know, do the schema inference on like, a terabyte data set, right? If you have like, hundreds of thousands of CSV files that all have the same format, just do the schema inference on one file and then apply that schema to the whole data set. And that, that avoids the, the, uh, the delay of doing it over the, the whole data set. You can also save the schema for uh, reuse. So you can actually write it out in JSON format uh, to like S3 or, or HDFS and then read it back in when your job runs and then just apply that to uh, your load command. Now with JSON, you can actually adjust the sampling ratio. By default, it's 100%, but you can actually reduce that if, uh, again, you're, you're confident in the, the, you know, the, the makeup of your JSON files and you don't want to scan the whole data set. So here's another example, right? Just, uh, and, and this is not even that big of a data set, but using uh, infer schema on a CSV data set, here it took uh, 48 seconds. Uh, here's the example of where we basically just do infer schema on one file and then apply that schema on the whole data set. So now we go from 48 seconds down to six seconds, six and a half seconds. And then the other option, like I mentioned earlier, you can actually save it out to JSON. So in this case, I saved it as a JSON string and then you can use the, uh, the Spark data type APIs to deserialize that into a uh, schema format and then apply that, and that reduces the time even further down to less than one second. So another question I, I tend to get is, you know, what format or compression or partitioning scheme should I use uh, for, you know, for my analytics? And, you know, a lot of this depends on the use case, right, whether it's like ad hoc or batch. Um, but in general, in terms of file types, you know, if you're doing, like, analytical type queries, obviously you want to prefer a format like Parquet. You know, you get column pruning and predicate push down. You know, I'm sure many of you have heard this already. Uh, you know, in, in terms of CSV and JSON, you know, you don't get those, but in addition, you have to remember, when Spark is reading those data sets, it has to read and, and deserialize or parse the whole row. So if you have a CSV data set that has 1,000 columns and you only care about two of them, it doesn't matter. Spark is going to have to parse the whole row, every row, and all those columns. And then finally, after it's read that uh, data set in, it can uh, apply the filtering. Whereas with Parquet, uh, it can actually push those filters down and, and do the col column pruning as it's loading the data. In terms of compression, obviously you want to prefer splittable uh, compression schemes. Um, with Parquet, uh, there, there's, sometimes there's some confusion, but you know, Parquet, you have to understand how Parquet is, is actually persisted. So uh, you can use formats like, or schemes like Snappy and Gzips, and because of the way Parquet is persisted and, and read in, it's splittable due to row groups. So uh, Snappy is actually the default in uh, Spark 2.2 now. Now, one thing you want to do is you want to avoid large Gzip text files. You know, I see this a lot, especially as people are migrating maybe from like a legacy database system or data warehouse. And typically, you know, the, the people running those systems, you know, they do like this mass export and you end up with these massive uh, gzip files that then they push up and, you know, people are expecting just to just, you know, run some Spark queries over these files. I've seen in some cases people trying to, you know, query like 100 gig uh, single G, uh, gzip CSV file. And, you know, they build these, like, massive clusters, and they're wondering, well, why is this so slow? Why is, why is it taking so long? Well, there's not much you can do. You know, uh, text gzip file um, is not splittable. So you can have a cluster with 1,000 cores, and you're only going to have one core reading it in. So uh, that, that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, also, a lot of things I tend to see are uh, garbage collection issues with very wide CSV files. And that's, again, because of the objects that are getting created as it's reading the data set. 
So if you want to uh, see more details, uh, there was a talk from Spark, Spark Summit in San Francisco earlier this year that goes into a lot more details uh, on, on this topic. So in terms of uh, another optimization that you can apply, you know, partitioning, uh, I've already described that. You know, that really just gives you coarse grain filtering of uh, you know, your, your input. Uh, another option is bucketing. So bucketing will basically persist your data already hash partitioned and, and uh, optionally you can sort it as well. And this is great if you're doing a lot of joins or aggregations on the keys. So you can you know, basically save the data already hash partitioned by those keys. Uh, now, one thing to keep in mind is that it does need to be a data source table, right? And so you can see the API here where I bucket by a column and uh, sort it. And so if I do any queries on this data set uh, and I do any sort of aggregation or join on that column, it doesn't have to uh, repartition it. So that'll save me time in terms of shuffles. So uh, one important thing to understand when you're dealing with partitioning and, and bucketing is that uh, each task in your uh, final stage as you're writing the data out, each of those tasks will write a file per partition and bucket. So if your data is randomly distributed across your tasks, you could end up with lots of small files, uh, you know, which uh, you know, they talked about in the keynote this morning, you know, and, and it leads to a bunch of issues after the fact. You have to worry about you know, how do you compact uh, the data set afterwards. You know, one option that you can apply is uh, coalesce, but realistically, I, I don't recommend that because really what that's doing is it's reducing uh, the parallelization of your job. And in some cases, that, that's gonna have an even worse impact. And it also doesn't guarantee the collocation of your partition and bucket values. So if you wanted to do repartition, in this case, what you could do is simply repartition by your partition by value, right, by the column. And in this case, what's gonna happen is it's gonna write nice, clean files, one file per partition. Now, one thing that can happen is you could actually end up with the other issue, which is your partitions are too large. So Spark 2.2 actually added a new feature, uh, a feature flag called max records per file. So what you can do is you can enable this and basically tell the task how many, how many records you want it to write per file. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here is that you know, this is not parallelized. So basically, as the task is writing data out, it's keeping a counter. And uh, once it reaches that max value, it then you know, closes that file and starts a new file. And if you need to parallelize that, then you'll want to you know, repartition with some sort of additional key uh, or you know, hash value that you can uh, better control the number of files. All right, another uh, question I tend to get is just like a general, like how do I optimize my query? Uh, and when I get these questions, you know, obviously I wanna look at the code, I wanna understand what you know, users are doing. I wanna look at things like query plans and statistics. And you know, a lot of times I get like something like this and uh, you know, trying to like decipher this, you know, and this is like a small example, like I have some that you know, can't even fit on a 4K ultra wide monitor, right? So trying to decipher this is, uh, can get pretty difficult. So there's a few different things to keep in mind. You know, one is Spark sh uh, SQL shuffle partitions. Uh, people new to Spark SQL uh, tend to not be aware of this setting. So this is a default setting that controls how many um, partitions uh, Spark uses when it's doing some sort of shuffle operation like group by repartition or joins or windows. And the default value is 200, but you know, in some cases that might be too much or it might be too little depending on your data volume. So you can override it, but the thing is that you have to keep in mind that this is a value that's applied to your whole job. So in this case, these are all the shuffle uh, boundaries in the query. So you know, that one value, maybe it's you know, good enough at the beginning of the query, but then I'm doing aggregations and filtering, and then by the time I get to the end of the query, maybe it's like way too much. Or the opposite, if I'm doing something like a you know, flat map or explode where I'm actually increasing the number of records. So uh, one uh, feature that was added in Spark 2.0, and this is something that's still in development, is called adaptive execution. And it's uh, disabled by default, but you can enable it. And you know, I want to be clear here: this is still in development. You know, I've seen this uh, improve things sometimes, and uh, in other cases, uh, not so much. But it's still useful to try. And basically, what this will do is it'll manage the the uh, shuffle partitions dynamically based on the the data size, the data volume. So there's the Jira there if you want to see more details on it. 
another uh, big thing that I r tend to run into is uh, unions. So I have uh, you know, some users that for whatever reason they're applying a union. In some cases, they're doing like self-unions where they're you know, loading a data frame, but then they have some sort of uh, you know, UDF or maybe they're you know, doing scoring, but they're doing it with different parameters or different models. And so their first instinct is, well, let me just you know, uh, do a loop and I'll just union the result of all these different data frames of, you know, of all these different operations that I defined. Well, that's really bad because basically what's happening is each of those unions, each of those data frames in the union gets run independently until there's a shuffle stage. So what that means is if you're doing a self-union, you're actually going to be reading the data set twice. And again, you know, if you're doing it more and more times, you know, that's just increasing the number of times that you're reading the data. So some alternatives that I've been able to, to uh, apply for some of my users is looking at things like explode or flat map, right? So this is in the case of, you know, you have a data set and you're just wanting to apply uh, different, uh, you know, different functions or different uh, operations, but you want it to do it to the same data set multiple times. So this is a good way to, to do that. Uh, you're not going to be reading the data set multiple times, and you get all those different versions of the rows, and it's just a, a cleaner query plan. The other option is if you absolutely have to do a, a union is uh, considering doing a persist or cache uh, so that then the union is operating off of uh, that uh, persisted data set. So in this case, in this query plan, these were the unions, right? So you can see like, you know, all these different, different uh, stages were running multiple times for basically the same data set. Uh, okay, real quickly, just uh, to finish up here, one um, key thing I wanted to talk about was the cost-based optimizer. So this was added in Spark 2.2, and this uh, basically lets you collect and use per-column statistics for query planning. This is, again, another feature that requires data source tables, and we have a very informative blog post that goes into a lot more details. And uh, this is the syntax here. Uh, the, the blog post goes into more detail, so I'll, I'll uh, just in, in essence of time, I'll, I'll skip that. But this is basically showing an example of a TPCDS query without cost-based optimizer. And with the optimizer, it rearranges the query and it actually reduces the shuffle by 90%. Uh, one other feature is uh, something that we have in, uh, uh, that we introduced in Databricks, in the Databricks Runtime 3.0. And this is called the Data Skipping Index. And so this, again, works with, um, uh, you know, when, it's, uh, when uh, the uh, catalyst is basically uh, applying filters to your data set. And what you can do is you can index your data set uh, so that when you're filtering, it can actually filter out files beyond partition pruning. So it's another feature, of course, that requires data source tables just to keep track of the metadata. And it's opt-in. It doesn't require any code changes to uh, your queries. Uh, we have uh, documentation on our website that you can see for more details and examples, but it's very simple syntax. You just call create uh, data skipping index on the table. And just as an example, uh, this is one query. So uh, without uh, the data skipping index, uh, this query here took uh, almost 20 seconds to run. And with the data sk skipping index, same exact query, same exact data set, and it went down to uh, uh, nearly uh, three seconds. All right, so we're running out of time here, so I'll just say, uh, uh, please, if you're interested in uh, these features, uh, definitely try out uh, Databricks uh, with the Databricks Runtime 3.3, and you can try out the Data Skipping Index and all uh, other features that we've provided. And uh, I wanted to call out uh, Bill and Matei's uh, definitive guide that's uh, in early preview now. All right, I don't know if we have enough time for questions. I apologize. All right, um, we can take one question. You got 53 seconds. I got a mic. We have two mics on the other side of the uh, camera. If you want to ask a question, please make it short, make it succinct, make sure you have a question mark at the end. Any questions? All right, give a big hand to Silvo. Thank you very much.